everybody, hope you're well. Today we'll read from a book titled The Politics of Living by Dot Architects, published by Toto. Politics of Living is our power to create small autonomous spaces. Living represents actual experiences or what has been previously experienced, such as face-to-face -face relationships, direct acquaintanceships and direct contact. In contrast, politics represents a place where people meet and make decisions, like the village gatherings that appear in folklorist Tsuneichi Miyamoto's The Forgotten Japanese, encounters with rural life and folklore. Power that is not from the centralized structure of indirect democracy that establishes the current state, but power to create smaller, more locally self-governing spaces depending on one's will and compromise. It is also the power to shift from a life that is equalized by information, statistics and future predictions to autonomously creating our own life full of idiosyncrasies. We would like to ponder on where the power lies. Tools, materials, repurpose, proactive mentality, diversification. Each topic has the potential to build relevance with the nature, culture, history and human behavior specific to the characteristics of each region. The current centralized framework or system creates a tendency to standardize data specific to a certain region or individual, thus loosening their uniqueness. The politics of living refers to the momentum required to reach people, things and landscapes to a distance close enough to decipher each of their details, understand them and create the potential roles embedded in each scenario beyond what is asked to each of us by the current society. To realize this, there arises a need for a physical space to foster it, making architecture a key player in the process. We at DOT Architects focus on the act of creating, modifying and using the spaces ourselves while working on each design project based on the architectural plan. The starting point of an individual architectural plan is of course important in the practices of designing, creating and using, but more so is the ability to listen to others who are involved, to go beyond the pre-planned, to practice across roles, to remain alert to volatility, to be tolerant of failed attempts and to improvise to sudden occurrences. As a result of the leveling off of all things caused by the networks of goods and information, life feels increasingly smaller day by day. Such well-organized networks may be necessary for our survival, however, more importantly, we need to create an autonomous space where each region's uniqueness could be fostered and maintain an environment where such small worlds can continue to exist in tandem. That way, we envision the current leveled-off state of world-making slow transformations toward a bumpy landscape, where differences can coexist to create an abundance in each individual's life. In this book, we, Dot Architects, introduce five notable projects we have worked on over the years. The photographs in this book are not meant to be illustrative of the architect's intentions, but rather to capture the workings of the structure and its surrounding in fragments. We hope our architectural ideal will be conveyed to the readers via these photographs. Number 7 a two-story residence, Dot Architects Yenari's own house, renovated from one of five Nagayas, raw houses, a style of traditional collective housing that were built over a hundred years ago. It is located in an area 15 minutes by foot from the center of Osaka city. Being spared from the war damages of the Osaka air raid in 1945, areas allocated with nagayas and small alleyways and streets remain. 
There are many old shops at the neighboring shopping arcades and markets, and the connection between local people remains strong. Although number 7 is located in an intricate alleyway, the north side, entrance side, is adjacent to other narrow alleyways, small vegetable gardens and a moderate-sized park. The renovation alleviates the darkness and claustrophobic feeling, which are typical characteristics of the Nagayas. It integrates light and attempts to restore the sense of openness from the front to the back of the house that was presumably present at the time of its initial construction. The opportunity came at a buffet party. In response to the request of the owner to renovate the Nagaya he just purchased into a café or gallery, Yenari replied, I feel bad for the neighbors if an unspecified number of unknown people came and go to this splendid alleyway. I will live here. The proposal to live here also expresses his feelings that opening up places and bringing new movements into it is not necessarily the best solution. I want to respect the way of living of this place. The small top light installed in the last room is diffused to restore the sense of openness from the front to the back of the house. By comprehending the bathroom as a small garden, light from the sky accumulates and it becomes a bright space. To alleviate the claustrophobic feeling of Nagayas, ideas to configure an atrium so that the line of sight leads towards the exterior and to use a translucent material for the floor on the second floor were devised, so that the effects of the window on the second floor is also utilized towards the first floor. The shoe storage, bookshelves, kitchen and toilet were considered to be all placed onto one side of the room, but only the shoe storage was moved to the west side. As a result, the back of the shoe storage is not exposed to gaze from the exterior and creates a calm place of belonging. More than two-thirds of the building's frontage is installed with a sash sliding opening. When one comes home, it functions as a sliding entrance door, and when one looks at the vegetable garden and the park from indoors, or when one cleans the alleyway, it can be used as a window for sweeping that opens into the garden. Living in an agaya requires its residents to share its small infrastructure starting from its structural elements, such as pillars, beams and roofs, to gutters, ditches and rogi. You feel the other residents' presence every day, even via the drainage flowing down the ditch in front of each unit from the dishes one resident has done at one end. Number 7 has been renovated once in the post-war era. Similarities can be discovered when comparing the renovation details of this house with that of other Nagayas. The structure went through three major phases of renovation, including this recent one before arriving at the present plan. The Nagaya had a shared drainage system in place to channel domestic sewage of each household unit located along the site's exterior passageway. To shorten the drainage path, the kitchen was placed nearest the entrance area along the alleyway. On the other side of the kitchen was a stairway leading to the second floor. There was no bathing space. Perhaps, accessibility to a nearby public bath was a factor in its absence. The house had two rooms past the entrance and kitchen on the first floor and two rooms on the second. Wooden fixtures divided the entrance area and the first room, Fuzuma, sliding doors, the tatami rooms. Each room had a oshire, closet, and tokonoma, a raised alcove, respectively, and a lavatory attached to the room farthest in on the first floor. The placement of the toilet must have been against the building's exterior wall that faced either a tsuboniwa, small garden, or a back passageway. 
This plan has been modeled after the style of traditional four-room farmhouses, except smaller in scale with a lengthwise layout. The racing middle-class consciousness brought about by the nation's industrial development during the post-war era was a factor in the emergence of bathrooms and washing machines in each household. As if to respond to this outlook, a one-story bathroom was added at the end of the farthermost room of this structure. The addition came with access to water supply from the back end of the house and a small laundry drying space on the roof of the structure. Simultaneously, the garden, or passage, that used to occupy the lot became an exterior area, with just enough space to place an outdoor unit, morphing completely into a rear facade with a change. Also, a top light was installed in the room at the farthest end to allow light to flow into it. It was also used as a changing room leading up to the new bathroom. This second renovation enlarged the interior space and improved household amenities to make daily housekeeping easier, but, on the downside, the house lost its pipe-like design that had allowed air to flow in from the outer passageway to the back end of the garden area, and also obtaining natural light was made difficult. This reduction in contact with the surrounding natural environment caused a curtailment in the house's positive attributes. This new project was undertaken while taking into account the reasons behind each renovation, both one and two, and at the same time without changing the original shape of the structure. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.